Hello, everyone. Welcome to SF Big Analytics. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, TJ. This is the other host, Anya. Um, and in the back, we have Chester and Allison helping people check in. Um, we're all from the meetup, and we're also from Alpine Data. So please, please check us out. I won't talk too much about us. Um, I'd also like to give a big thanks to Yelp for hosting us today. So they're very generous um, and provide their facilities along with uh, pizza and beer, recording, security, all that good stuff. We'd like to thank them. Um, they're also, of course, hiring. Um, I'm, I'm sure they're hiring many, many positions. Um, if you're interested in working for Yelp, then um, Rebecca and Wynn at the back um, is the person you should talk to. Um, so now let me introduce Anya. Thanks. And uh, at Alpine, we're also hiring, so talk to us. Um, but tonight, we're going to talk about, um, we're going to hear about Apache Arrow. So you've all heard about the columnar data stores. Well, Apache Arrow takes advantage of both modern hardware and the columnar data stores like Parquet, et cetera. So as Python users, we're all excited to hear from Wes McKinney, who knows all about um, getting up around bottlenecks in your, in, uh, your data analysis plan. Wes is the um, author of the best-selling book, Python for Data Analysis. He also created Pandas and Ibis. And so uh, please join me in welcoming Wes as he talks about Apache Arrow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just here in February 17th for the SF Python meetup, so it kind of gives me a flavor of maybe what it felt like to be Bob Barker for about, you know, 30 years on the, on the Price is Right. Um, a small flavor, small flavor. Um, so th this talk is a little bit of a, a little bit of a preview of some things that tell you about some things that have already happened and, and also a lot of things that are, that are in the works. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm very hesitant to give talks about things that are, that are in the works or that don't exist yet because people love to throw around that, uh, around that term vaporware. Um, but, you know, part of the reason I've been um, spending a lot of energy on this new project, Apache Arrow, is that it's really important to build, um, you know, it's a project that is made important by, by virtue of having um, a lot of different parts of the open source uh, data analysis, big data community involved in it. Because it really is about coming together and you know hearing about use cases, developing consensus around some of these shared problems, and building solutions together so that we can all have software that works better together, um, that is faster, you know, more interoperable. And at the end of the day, data scientists, um, people doing analytics, will be a lot more, a lot more productive. That's the hope. So I work on uh, data science tools at Cloudera. I've been there for about about 18 months, and I've spent uh, essentially all of my career working on, at the end of the day, user interfaces for working with data. It turns out that about 90% of the work in building these user interfaces are systems problems, so software engineering and moving around bytes really fast. Um, so I'm hoping that someday that I can spend more of my, my time just working on user interfaces to work with data rather than building systems. But for the time being, I'm happy uh, to continue to work on systems insofar as it, as it makes the software faster, more scalable, and easier to use. Um, I've, I've been involved, involved in a variety of open source projects. In the last 18 months, I've, I've gotten more um, um, in contact with the Apache Hadoop ecosystem. Um, so uh, three projects I listed there. So Arrow, which is a brand new project, and the Apache Parquet project. Um, and I also have submitted a couple Python patches to Kudu. Um, so now Kudu has, I won't talk about Kudu in this talk, but it's a really cool kind of real-time column store. So if you need to store a lot of analytical data that's changing really fast, um, Kudu is a really neat technology, and I'm, I'm happy that it now has a beta quality Python interface in addition to its Java and C++ interfaces. <laughs> So I have this trick where I change the language in my Siri, you know, because sometimes like it'll start talking during a meeting, and so if you change the if you change the voice, it will stop responding to "Hey Siri" or you know whatever was you know whatever was triggering it. So I have the magic voice for Siri, apparently. Um, I also signed on recently to to start working on the second edition of my book, which will turn four years old in October, and um, I don't think I'm going to finish the second edition in time for the four-year um, four birthday, but 
it should be toward, toward the end of the year. It really depends on how, how busy I get with other things, but um, it's definitely, as the, the Python data stack has matured, um, having a um, second you know, uh, major revision of the book with, with new content to incorporate stuff that's happened in the last four years. So I started working on this project in like 2010, and I was trying to work with John Hunter and Fernando Perez from the IPython project and Brian Granger, and we were all too busy to get a book together, and so um, I decided to go it alone at the end of 2011. Um, but, you know, it was a good time, uh, and, and I'm glad that the, the book happened, but it's, it's time, for, time for a refresh. So I wrote a blog post on February 17th, was, which was the last day that I was here, um, generally looking at um, what, if you're a Python programmer and you want to do big data and use Hadoop, where, you know, where do things stand? What are the problems that still need solving? What's working well, not working well? What's not working well? It's not exactly a comprehensive post, but at least highlights some of the problems where I've been thinking, um, thinking a lot about. Um, I actually have you know, irons in the fire in each of, these, each of these areas, and I'll tell you about some of those things, like what are the you know, things as Python programmers that you may see in the next 12 months as well as some of the infrastructure work that's happening to make those interesting user visible projects possible. So we need to be able to read and write all of the file formats which are stored in S3 and HDFS um, that are interacted with by Hadoop. So you know, things like reading and writing parquet files would be a really great place to start. Um, currently, if you're a Python programmer, you have to go through some other system to be able to interact with these files, which makes me uh, a little bit grumpy. Um, you need to be able to inter interact more productively and, and a lot faster with the file systems. So building richer, um, richer layers for orchestrating large amounts of I.O., um, dealing with you know, S3 and HDFS. You know, if you go from dealing with 50 gigabytes of data on your laptop using HDF5 to using HDFS and S3, you feel like comparatively you're stuck in quicksand. And I think there's some things that we can do to, to improve that. Um, the driver libraries for interacting with all of these compute systems, the SQL engines, um, as well as you know, Spark and kind of next-gen generalized compute um, can certainly be made a lot better to be a better um, you know, friend to you know, Python code that you are supplying to run inside those, those, those big machines. So, um, so the point of this talk is to talk about Apache Arrow, um, the technical, some of the technical details and to show you like, you know, what, what, will, what will it lead to and how will it, it impact your life in a positive way. Uh, a bunch of these slides are from my Strata talk, which I gave with Jacques Nadeau, from, uh, who's the VP of Apache Drill. And so Drill, the Drill project played a major role in helping Arrow come about. Um, so I'm very indebted to, to them for, for helping get this project uh, off the ground. So Arrow is a new um, top-level project that we announced within the Apache Software Foundation back in February. Um, and it has to do with representing columnar data in memory. So if you're a Python Pandas user, you're already dealing with in-memory columnar data, but it's using NumPy for the memory representation. So if you have uh, numeric data, it's probably NumPy arrays, float64, float using um, np.nan to represent missing data. So you can think of Arrow as being a more generalized um, and standard columnar data representation that systems can share and not only use to accelerate the computations within their own walls. So if you're a Python user, you can just use Arrow. This is, you know, engineers building data systems. You can use Arrow as the in-flight like where you put data and, and how you compute things in memory. But you can also use Arrow as a medium for exchanging data between systems without having to perform a uh, conversion. Um, it does deal with flat, I mean, most of our data is flat, but increasingly there's more and more complex type data. So as more, more of the world's data is being generated in JSON, you know, nested format, you know, very complex documents are being generated by web applications. It's very nice to be able to have a, an efficient memory representation for that data once you parse it from JSON that you can do analytics in memory um, without a lot of, um, that's very efficient for the CPU to, um, you know, to analyze. 
part of why it's taken us a while to get the project going is that we wanted to get a lot of open source projects to think about the problem and decide if we could all work together to build something that we all use. Um, and so, you know, working together, this is like a, you know, and the list will keep growing as more, more projects get involved with, get involved with Arrow. But we found that there was a shared need and I, I found it when I came to start working on, uh, deal, you know, working with Hadoop. I was like, well, I need a way to hand off data or to receive data from systems or to push data into systems. And so needing to convert between the NumPy kind of pandas memory representation and something else that other systems can understand. And as we poked around inside, you know, Cloudera with other Apache projects that we're working on, as well as outside in the community and other, you know, other um, open source projects, we found that everyone was sort of running into these problems. We're spending all of our time um, converting between different memory representations to move data around between, between systems. So our, our hope and goal of the project is that after we, you know, as we build consensus and we build more Arrow implementations, that more and more of the world's data will be represented in Arrow data structures. It will be the de facto form in which it is analyzed in memory and the way that it moves around between systems. Um, so that, that kind of brings us to the project and it's a little bit inscrutable if you aren't um, part of a, you know, team building database systems or, or, or implementing, implementing analytics. It isn't directly relevant to you as a user. Um, it's not a piece of software that you download and you import in Python and you start using. Um, although there is now a PyArrow library, which is kind of confusing, and I'll explain that a little bit. Um, but the, the big part of the project is a specification which describes the memory layout for tables um, that supports complex you know, nested types. And the importance of that specification is that systems that are written in any programming language, if they say like, I speak Arrow, you speak Arrow, we can send data back and forth without having to perform an expensive conversion. Um, so the particular systems where I'm really interested in using it are the SQL engine, so things like Impala, storage, columnar storage systems like Kudu, binary file formats like Apache Parquet, and generalized compute engines like Apache Spark. And so if you've, if you've never you know, looked at column, column databases or column stores, a lot of the efficiency in, um, in columnar data comes from taking effectively tables, and rather than the traditional, this would be like the Postgres, like the standard Postgres, HStore, MySQL, SQL database, is that each row of data, the, the, the values in one row are packed in a, in a tuple, and then those tuples are laid out in a data page on disk. Whereas in a columnar memory layout, all of the data of a particular type is stored in contiguous memory. And so if you have a query which only touches timestamps or only touches session IDs, you can scan and perform analytics on that data in a very um, CPU cache efficient way. Um, and in particular, if you have very wide tables and very large data sets, typically when you run an analytical query, you're only touching a small portion of the data set. And so columnar memory layouts allow you to only touch um, the data that's relevant to your, uh, to your data analysis. And in particular, as you know, solid state disk and you know, if you look at like the non-volatile memory stuff you know, that, that's happening you know, right now, there's this kind of convergence between like RAM is the new disk. And so um, you know, the, the way in which CPUs interact with RAM and, um, you know, and also their own kind of memory caches, the way in which like memory access patterns are going to you know, make more and more of a difference on the runtime of, of applications. The bigger thing for Python programmers is actually this, this diagram which shows the current state of the world where whenever you want to connect to a system, you, you look at you know, a database system or a, um, like a storage engine or a compute system and you say, how do I talk you know, how does Pandas talk to, you know, a SQL engine? How does, how does Pandas talk to a, a, a file format? And so you end up with this, like, um, you know, N adapters problem where you're building for each, you know, N choose two adapters. So for every system, it's like you're building the Python to Parquet adapter or the Python to Postgres, Postgres adapter. And so with every new system, you've got to build a new adapter. And so what Arrow allows us to do 
is if every system can exchange data in a common memory layout, then as a Python Pandas user say, you only need to deal with one um, memory format. So you can ask a system to give you arrow memory and you can adapt that arrow memory to Pandas data structures or whatever you're doing um, in Python. So it drastically simplifies the amount of code um, that people like, like me have to write. Um, it also makes the systems a lot faster because there isn't all of this um, copying and conversion between, um, between systems. It also allows us to share code between projects um, in a more straightforward way. And so um, I'm going to give you a concrete example of that, um, which many of you have probably already seen if you follow me on social media. But uh, recently I looked at the um, I.O. performance of various tools for um, getting data into a Pandas data frame. And these, so these numbers um, are not rigorous. They were performed on a um, um, three-year-old laptop. So there's certain like environment-specific things. I'm sure if I ran it on a big, a big box with latest gen hardware and lots of RAM that the numbers would come out differently. Um, but there's an order of magnitude um, performance uh, thing here, which is, you know, I think instructive just in terms of like thinking about, you know, how fast is it to move data around. And so if you're a Pandas user, the best way to store data on disk by, by far and away is, is, the H, is the HDF store, which uses the scientific um, data format, HDF5. And I think this like performance number of pulling, this is like 100 megabytes of data pulling from HDF store. And I was able to get on my laptop around, you know, over 700 megabytes per second. So there's definitely some like OS, like file system, page caching stuff going on. Um, but, you know, in terms of like just order of magnitude compared with parsing CSV files, parsing a CSV file is a lot of work. And there's a lot of like scrutinizing of bytes to be able to read a text file and convert it to a binary uh, data frame in memory. And so, you know, you'd like to be moving, you know, given that most systems have schemas, the data is already binary in memory, you would like not to have to go through CSV files or some, something that is expensive to read and write in order to exchange data. I looked at um, SQL-like systems like Spark and Impala, and part of the problem here is that the drivers for interacting with these systems are not very good um, in Python, and so there's a lot of work, basically Python for loops where data is being deserialized into um, pandas data frames. So there's, there's, you know, clearly these numbers should be a lot, should go from, you know, the sort of six megabytes per second to, you know, hopefully we could get things up to like 100 to 200 megabytes per second. I think getting up to the speed of HDF5 um, is not realistic because you're dealing with memory bandwidth on your system, but certainly uh, more than an order of magnitude improvement um, should be possible. So I wanted to, um, just as a, a proof of concept with, with the Arrow project, I saw Hadley Wickham from the R community at the end of January and I told him about Arrow. And uh, he mentioned to me that R doesn't have a very good, um, well, has, it has a number of binary file formats, um, but they, um, the performance is not great. So the, the main one that people use is the RDS files. So the performance of dot of dot RDS is not great, um, and uh, and also those files are proprietary to R, and so we sat down and said, well, can we come up with a file format that uses Apache Arrow that we can read and write in Python and R, and that is the same in both languages, um, and that would also solve a big problem that many data scientists use both Python and R. And currently, the best way to move data, or before we worked on this project, the best way to move data back and forth in an ephemeral way was to call write.csv in R and then pandas read, dot c, read underscore csv in Python. And that really kind of is a bummer to us. So we created a file format. It's called Feather. Um, it's uh, after, after Arrow, of course. It uh, is very, very fast and very, very easy to use. So it's not designed for long-term storage, but it's... Uh, so just to give you an idea, um, so this is our studio. We have the Feather library. I'm going to make a data frame that has 10 million rows um, with 12 columns, a bunch of NAs. Just, you know, the way that R deals with missing data is a little different from Python. 
Um, so you create a data frame, and the way you use feather is just write feather data frame in the path, and that's it. So let me um, try actually writing the file. Write feather. That's done. That was a gig of data. So now I'm going to do feather metadata on test.feather. And so you can see that in R, it's this feather file, 10 million by 12. Here's the column names and their types. Um, now I go into IPython, import feather, um, feather, read, read data frame, test.feather. <coughs> And I'll just time it. So there's probably some OS caching, but um, I think it's like 960 megabytes divided by 1.242, so 670 megs a second. It's pretty good. Um, and um, you know, there's the there's the data in Python, and there's the there's the data in R. Um, so super nice, super easy. And if we wanted to go back from feather feather right data frame df test two dot feather. And then in R, it's read feather test two dot feather df two. And so, so that's nice. So if you've ever struggled to move data back and forth, um, now there's a nice tool. Um, love to have you involved with the project. Um, Part of, why, part of why we did that is that I think it's a, it's a preview of, of like what's possible using this technology, um, just extremely fast data interchange between systems. If you, if you really want to geek out on this stuff, we're using uh, Google's flat buffers library to store the metadata at the foot of the file. Um, that's also a really super cool and very easy to use, surprisingly easy to use project for creating custom file formats. Um, uh, another project where um, it, for Python users, the error will have some impact is the um, Parquet uh, columnar storage format. So Parquet's design is a very efficient, heavily encoded, heavily compressed file format for storing analytical data in HDFS. Um, you can store it in, you can put it on your laptop, you can store it in many different places, but that was what it was designed for. Um, so compared with, um, I haven't run benchmarks yet, mainly because I'm still working on the Parquet adapter. But um, I've, I, about two months ago, what is it, April? So about three months ago, I started working on the Parquet C++ implementation. Um, they were kind enough to make me a committer on the project. So now we have a nearly complete C++ reader, reader implementation of Parquet. Um, so you, as a Pandas user, soon, and soon means whenever I can find the time to finish the first the V1 of the inter integration. Um, the way the flow will work is under the, under the hood, the Parquet C++ library will be invoked from the arrow C++ library. You'll get an arrow table, and you'll be able to convert that um, transparently to a pandas data frame. And then with a little bit more, or a lot more engineering work, you'll be able to go back to Parquet files. Um, and so this has the benefit that any um, any system that uses C++ or can invoke C or C++ will be able to use both the Parquet C++ library and the Arrow stuff. That includes R, so if R wants to be able to read and write Parquet files, they'll be able to share code much in the same way that with Feather we're using the exact same C, C++ code. Um, so the performance between R and Python Feather is, is identical because we're using the same code base. So so that's cool, in my opinion. Um, we're hoping to see more, you know, more implementations of, um, of, of Arrow across more programming languages. There's an existing Java implementation which was cut out of the Apache Drill project. Um, Intel just contributed a large patch to uh, add an alternate memory allocator to the, uh, uh, to the Java implementation that uses non-volatile memory, um, a new uh, Apache project called Mnemonic, which is, which is really very cool. Um, but as far as like where we are, where we're at in development, and if you're interested in getting involved in the project, it's still very low level. You know, build the data structures, convert the data structures between different representations, and deal with kind of managing memory between, um, you know, between systems. So just being able to efficiently move data around is going to be our concern for the uh, for the near future. And so in the long run, 
you know, I see the way that like Pandas will connect to all these systems is via, um, you know, via the arrow memory, which is a lot more general and flexible than the than Pandas' um, internal NumPy-based memory representation. So if you use Pandas a lot, you'll know that there's various corners that were cut in the interest of shipping something. Like we don't have nulls and integer arrays. Strings are stored in Python objects. So if you have very large arrays of strings and pandas, you'll know they use a lot of memory. Um, and so you know, by using Arrow, we can play a number of tricks to get better performance, a lot better memory use. We're also working on, on the semantics of moving data around between systems. So if this is something that you're interested in, um, one thing we tried to start was using um, memory maps to, um, to write basically a description of a chunk of a table into a memory map so that we can move data between um, off-heap Java, JVM memory, and C++, you know, Python-driven code. And so I think there's a lot of interest in sharing memory more efficiently between Java-based systems and C, C++-based systems like Python. And that's traditionally been a major blocker to better Python integration in the Hadoop world because of the cost of moving data back and forth. Um, you know, traditionally, if you used JNI to invoke, um, you know, to go one way or the other, you pay, a, you pay a conversion cost moving data back and forth. And so we hope to, um, to avoid some of that through the, this um, shared memory shared memory work. So another project that's very relevant, important for, for Python users is how we can take functions that we write and push them down into the compute layer of, um, of, big, of big data systems. And so if you're a Spark user, you can think of this as like when you write a Lambda function and you either use it in Spark SQL or with um, rdd.map, so you're handing off a Python function to Spark to evaluate on a distributed on a distributed data set. You're directly having to deal with this language kind of data interoperability problem of how is data made available to a black box Python function that you wrote, and how what are the semantics of invoking that function on a very large distributed data set. So you can think about you know the the way that. Um, the semantics of, of, of systems like Spark, I wrote SQL Engine here, but you know, really any um, distributed in-memory type of system, so you have a very large data set which is partitioned amongst a set of nodes, and then you have some Python code that you wrote, and the Python code only ever sees one chunk of a data set at a time. And so if you want to run that, and, and the thing is, like, this system doesn't know anything about your Python code. All it, see, all it knows is, Maybe you've, maybe you've told it like what, what are the input types of the function, what are the output types. But otherwise, it, all it knows how to is how to spawn a Python interpreter, um, tell the Python interpreter to unpickle your function, um, you say here's some data, run that function and let me know when you're done, and then send the data back. So there you're really critically dealing with this data movement problem of how does data make its way from you know, Spark or from a SQL engine um, into, the, into the Python interpreter process, invoke the Python function, and then send the data back. Um, so in addition, you know, Python code itself is not very fast, and so the way that this function is run needs to be kind of pandas-like. So at the end of the day, you're writing um, table-like code that is wrapping C, you know, fast, you know, NumPy-like C code um, that, is, that is running in a vectorized way on that data. So any, any code that is putting a Python function inside a for loop that is going row by row over a data set um, is not going to have good, good performance um, in, you know, if, you're from a, if you're using Python. Um, so the major things that are, that are up next for, for the project where I'm, I'm spending a lot of energy, the... Um, First big one is building a uh, you know, really good parquet support for, um, for Python. So I don't know if anyone in the room uses parquet actively. Some, maybe, yeah, some of you. Um, so as that has become, you know, has become one of the most important data formats for doing analytics, both in Spark as well as SQL engines like Hive and Impala and Drill. Um, and so more and more data, the workflow is I have a bunch of JSON, I convert that JSON ETL it into, into Parquet, 
and then put that in a place where I can run Spark jobs on it to do further ETL or to run SQL queries on it to power some analytical, analytical application. Um, and this is great because, in particular, Spark has made it really, really easy to, you know, if you have a Parquet file on your desktop, you can just say, you know, give me a Spark data frame pointing at that Parquet file, and then you can either use data frame operations on it or you can run Spark SQL, and you have a lot of flexibility um, to be able to run very, very fast code on that, on that data. And so if you're a Python programmer, to be both a consumer and a producer of Parquet data is becoming more and more more and more important. So if you want to write ETL code in pandas and read that data, run some pandas, you know, data, data preparation, write the data back out, that you have very, very fast tools which are at the, at the caliber of what you know, Python scientific computing, Python data users have come to expect within kind of a local, um, you know, local environment. We still have work to do to connect um, Python and C++ efficiently to, um, to Java systems. So um, nothing, I have nothing available to demo yet, but I'm really excited to, to get that working to you know, start having some proofs of concept of Python working in tandem with um, you know, distributed systems like, um, like Spark and Drill and things that are written in Java, where um, you know, using Python as a tool for writing computations and, and building new operators like user-defined functions, um, you know, given the you know, productivity of writing Python code and the fact that we have like, nice vectorized, fast NumPy pandas code, it'd be really nice to be able to use that uh, in a seamless way in a big data, big data context. Um, and the other thing is just, in general, having a unified interface for dealing with storage systems um, in, the, in the big data ecosystem. So if you're, if you're using pandas, that you're not having to deal with like, well, I've got 12 libraries for, you know, I've got to find the library to talk to this system. It'd be nice to have kind of one unified point of contact um, to say like, give me a table, put a table, get a table. Um, there'll be a little bit of schema wrangling if like one system has, you know, different ways of handling, hand handling data types. Um, but, you know, I've heard from, you know, talking to people over the last couple of years, there's a lot of time spent um, just like that kind of wrangling, moving data around. Um, it would be nice to be spending more time analyzing the data and building models. Um, so I have a little time, so I'll give you a flavor of what... Um, it's, very, uh, it's very low level, but uh, just to give you a, a brief flavor of what Arrow looks like in, in Python at the, at the very lowest level. Um, so this is brand spanking new code, but... There is a PyArrow library. Um, I can um, create Arrow C++ objects from things like Python lists. I don't know if you all can read this. It's going to be the most anticlimactic demo you've ever seen. Uh, so I created, uh, I created an Arrow array from the list one, two, three, four, and so you see I now have an N64 array. Um, but this is cool because this is actually a C++ um, object under the hood. And so, um, and there's some glue for dealing with Python, but I can call, um, let's see here. Um, forget how to use my own library, but. Uh, so I can't convert back, but I can index into it and get values. Um, if I have nuns in it, those go through as um, there is like an NA value type. So if I, um, there's, there's a special um, pi arrow um, NA value. Um, so if you do R sub two, I didn't try this code, so forgive me if it fails. R sub two is pi arrow NA, so it's a first class NA value. Um, if I have pandas data frame, so SF big analytics, if I have a data frame, um, there's a function from pandas data frame which creates an arrow table, which I haven't written a wrapper for. Oops. Um, so that is a um, 
arrow table, kind of in C++ containers, and then a two pandas function, which goes back. What's cool about the library is that it handles, um, it handles nested data transparently. So let's say I had like, you know, foo bar here, maybe like a none, and then an empty list, and then a none, and another empty list, and then maybe like one, two, close brace. Um, I don't know if you can read this, but if you look at the, like what is the type of this thing, it's actually a list of, a list of string. Um, and then if I index into it, you see I get the, what looks like a Python list, but is actually um, a reference to a value in the arrow list, which um, you certainly hope is, well, uh, value type, okay. Um, so it, and it is of, it is of string type, but it's it's turtles all the way down. So if I did something like um, from PyList, here's where I'm going to get myself into trouble. <laughs> okay, I, I did it right. Okay, so now I added an extra layer of nesting, and so. This one is list of list of, of int. Um, and you know, you could go back here and add another layer of nesting and none. And so you would hope that you know, it keeps being you know, list of list of list of list of, of int. But you know, if I index into it, you know, I've got the inner element, which is list of list of int. But then the second element is null. Um, so there's plenty of interesting things you can do. Because of the, um, the way that Arrow represents data in memory, that these numbers at the innermost level are actually all contiguous. They're, they're in the same memory buffer. And so like the structure of the array is kind of layered on top. And so things like nesting and unnesting um, repeated data are free, which is really cool. Um, and so if you're doing, you know, large scale kind of JSON wrangling, as we build out and build uh, algorithms for working with this data, um, you know, it will use much less memory and be, and be way faster. So it's a lot of work, of course, and just coming up with a, you know, py Pythonic syntax for interacting with, with data like this is going to be a, a pretty significant design challenge, but, but one that I'm, I'm very excited to work on. So that's, uh, that's all I have for the talk. And, and uh, you know, if, if this project is interesting to you and you, have, you, you um, experience these prob problems at different layers of the stack, we'd love to have you involved, join the mailing list, and uh, you know, or come on the Slack and, and uh, tell us what you're working on. Um, but uh, you know, spend 10, 15 minutes uh, answering questions. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Uh, is there a support for chunking? Um, so like if you want to modify or append something, like um, you don't have to rewrite the entire, like you don't have to move a lot of bytes around because of the contiguous requirements. Yeah, so the, the, the data structures are immutable. So um, in the event that you are modifying um, things a lot, it will be you know, copy and write. Well, you'll get a new data structure back when you apply you know, modifications or changes. Um, but the, the intent for very large tables is to have everything be chunked. So if you modified like, or like filtered out some section of a table, like you might only be touching like one small chunk of the table. And because everything is immutable, you can reuse data without having to worry about, you know, reference counting and like ownership, things like that. And like having to set like writable flags and like, don't, you know, you don't, don't touch my memory because that belongs to me. And that's actually been a, a big issue um, in pandas. If you, if you look at the code, there's a huge amount of defensive copying. And if everything in pandas were copy on write, I think the library would be, the code would be a lot cleaner, it would be faster, it would just be a lot more you know, easier to, to reason about. But the, um, the NumPy kind of memory model is that any slot, any slot like you can just change, you, know, you can just change a number in the middle of an array 
unless the writable flag is set false. Um, but I think it's nice to have kind of that clean. It's it is a trade-off, but but I, I think given that we you know we're working with nested data, um, even modifying nested data structures would require building a new a new array because um, it's all kind of you know fully shredded, kind of contiguous at the leaf nodes. So like if you touch a, a variable length element, you have to rebuild the the leaf with all the data. Well, the chunking, the chunking is ad hoc. So, so nothing like in a in a primitive array. I mean, you can look at the spec, but like in a primitive array, like nothing is chunked. So the chunking is like you know we'd have, you'd have to implement that in the application. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, does it make a size of the data can change it? Does Does it make a file size difference? Yeah. Well, I mean, you can you can do compression and encoding. It's not a it's not a storage format. So if you look at the at the feather file, so I wrote about nine hundred sixty million bytes of data. Um, I don't know what the extra the extra bytes are, but um, it's about one to one right now. So there's no there's no effort to like encode or or compress in memory. But you could certainly you could certainly layer that on top if you know memory savings kind of in memory were were, were important. Hey, you mentioned that error uh, is for in-memory storage, but you also create feather for uh, data exchange between R and Python. On the other hand, um, people can use Parquet to exchange data, and if you have an in-memory caching layer, you can also use Parquet to uh, get fast uh, data access. So my question is basically how you uh, tell the difference between error and Parquet. Yeah, so error is not... Um, I think the main difference between the parquet on disk representation and arrow's kind of in-memory representation is the arrow supports random access, so you can you can pick out any cell in, in um, you know an arbitrarily nested structure in constant time, and with a very kind of predictable memory access pattern, whereas um, parquet is is you know heavily encoded and compressed in the kind of Dremel style repetition definition level. Kind of encoding described in the Google Dremel paper, paper, and so Parquet and Arrow are designed to work like to be complements to each other. So when you deserialize a Parquet file, you need a columnar data structure in memory to put the data in. And so there will be some applications where, if you're basically scanning, you know, scanning a file once and never like visiting the the data more than once, like just scanning the file and moving on to the next chunk of data might be the might be the optimal. Kind of the optimal way, but if you have you know data that is being you know iterated on or used like you know cells are using being used multiple times, like having that um, you know random access data structure is very useful. So I think like we never intended it as a file format, and Feather was honestly like a um, like a quick hack to uh, to build something useful that would you know that show that um, at least that the arrow specification could be adequate for the needs of Python and R. So one thing that came out of that was that we we felt we feel that um, having a native like factor or category type um, would would have a place in the arrow spec. Um, so currently it does not. So that was like one thing that came out. Like both Python and R need categories, um, which is distinct from dictionary encoding. Semantically equivalent, but like not no. It's semantically distinct, but representationally equivalent. Um, is the categories have meaning in the context of a, of a data analysis. One question over here. Oh, sure, sure. I'll come back to you, yeah. What do you mean by slow for Python and what's non-volatile memory performance? Because we're seeing better performance in volatile SSD memory, 10 three-order magnitude. So what do, you, what do those look like? Oh, actually, I actually haven't run any any um, any benchmark any benchmark comparisons with uh, you know different um, you know, types of solid state, but uh, I'm pretty interested in it. So I'm sure like sharing your experience, um, especially if you've been doing like SIMD and like hardware optimizations, I think would be really interesting to hear your hear your experience on the on the. We're seeing list. sub millisecond local just on unoptimized code. So it's broke the world record with the Intel stuff with the Allegro stuff. So 
Yeah. The question for me is for vol non-volatile memory, what's the benefit for that if you write good buffers and good replication at 3x, three order of magnitudes, 1,000x faster, you kind of don't have to worry about the problems of non-volatile memory, even if you're buffering it. Right. Yeah, I admit I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on the, um, you know, the places where, where NVM is a, is a win or you know, either gives you better performance or um, better kind of like fault, fault tolerance. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to learn more. Hi. Uh, does does Arrow has to deal with a uh, uh, memory alignment issue and the NDNS issue? And the other question is uh, how many data types uh, Arrow uh, will be supporting? So for memory alignment. Um, there's certain, it would be good to get your perspective on the, on the spec. Um, I know we've discussed at least having like a minimum alignment requirement so that, you know, so that people doing a lot of SIMD, like SSE, AVX stuff won't have, um, will have fewer, fewer problems, especially when they're receiving data from some other source, like not having to perform a bunch of copying to put the data in aligned memory. Um, so for example, um, like the bitmaps for storing nulls. So we, we discussed having the, the bitmaps be word, word aligned rather than, rather than byte aligned so that, you know, there would be, few, there, you know, that at least whenever you're pulling a buffer out of, out of shared memory, that you're always dealing with word aligned, word aligned memory at minimum. Um, but, you know, there's probably some other, it's probably some other concerns there. For, for data types, um, the, the, there's, Physical data types, so things that are fixed width, you know, fixed bit width or fixed byte width, um, and then variable length things, and then there's a, there's a couple of other types like union, so you can have something that is semantically one-dimensional, but actually can have, every slot could have a different type. So there's a couple of different union representations, um, and like a struct or like tuple kind of notion, where like each of the fields is its own subarray. Um, but the, for, for logical types, so if you have like an eight byte int, you might want to say like that is a timestamp. And so that's like the domain of logical types and that will grow to you know, be a very long list. Um, I guess we haven't really figured out like long-term like a management strategy as like more systems use arrow and we end up with like dozens or you know, dozens and dozens of logical types because everyone has slightly different uh, you know, ways to store date and time types and decimals, things like that. Um, hello. Uh, 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 as a file format, what kind of compatibility guarantee we have in, in uh, Apache Array? I mean, if I store my data in uh, 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 error format, Today, in a couple of years, do we have to transform that in some oh, other format? Um, well, it, it, Arrow is not a storage format, um, and with with Feather, which is you know a quick file format that we made using using the Arrow memory representation, um, we explicitly state that it's not for long term storage. So don't store a lot data long term in Feather. Maybe at some point we'll we'll figure out, you know, as more. Um, I think for. We only intend at the moment to use Feather for exchanging data between Python R, excuse me, Python R and Julia. But we'd like to make the format stable. But at this point, you know, given that it will, you know, it will change, and also there's certain aspects of the Arrow memory representation that are that are under discussion on the on the mailing list. Um, you know, it's you know, it's not a data, it's not a form of, of data storage more as it is like transient kind of in-memory representation for using for implementing, implementing data systems and exchanging data between systems at runtime. So kind of in, you know, um, at least Feather kind of as conceived right now is, is plays a similar role to, to Pickle for Python. So you, you don't store things long-term in Pickle, but you can store them for an hour or if you're a few days. Um, I have found cases where people stored things in pickle format for a few years, and then you know we've been we've been supporting. I think we're up to like five or six like legacy pickle you know formats in pandas, and 
I don't recommend that. Like it's you know having binary file formats that are are is is a good idea. Um. Uh, this goes to the libraries that will be reading files from disk and converting into memory. Um, do you, will you support being able to split up uh, one file into many different um, subfiles and being able to easily specify, like, okay, I only want to read like seven files, and because those are the columns or whatever I'm interested in. And what 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 kind of files? So like Parquet or you know like even Feather like if you had like three or four Feather files but you wanted to read a subset into memory and um, so so right now it would be easy um, so so Feather is basically the easy, like the simplest the simplest columnar format you could devise so there's metadata at the foot the data is stored end to end with no compression or encoding so compared with like Parquet it's a you know, Parquet is extremely complex by comparison, um, but also has uses like bit packing and run length encoding and a bunch of like advanced, you know, delta encoding for strings, like a bunch of advanced storage techniques to save space and give better performance, especially on like analytical data, which is highly compressible. And so this is kind of, so Feather's kind of like dumb data exchange, but it's very, very fast, so it runs at disk speed effectively. Um, but is more of like an exchange format between you know between the programming languages. So I don't think we intend to build um, much tooling on top or, or managing like large, very large multi-file data sets with Feather. Maybe somebody will build like a you know like a cache. Like I guess so somebody built like a um, for Python like a sh like a Feather shelf. Um, you know, call it like a duvet or something. Uh, <laughs> but uh, where you know because. I think it's it's most useful as like a hot like a you know because you're working with suppose you have like a working set of data that's in the in the range of like 50 to 100 gigs but you only have 16 gigs of memory and so you just want to like rotate through like a very large collection of data and so your workflow is like read a file do a thing you know release the file from memory read the next file and so I think like as that for that use case um, it's a it's a pretty good a pretty good choice so if you were like um, I don't know. As as I get closer on the uh, Parquet C++ stuff, it'll be interesting to to run benchmarks with highly compressible data to see like what kind of throughput you get reading highly compressed Parquet files versus versus Feather files. Um, I made no intent of making them competitive at all. Yeah, I guess my motivation is more for pipelining of um, operations when you have data loading and decompression. So if you wanna, if you have a giant piece of data. That's stored on disk, and you want to maybe use all the cores to, you know, uh, decompress into memory. So that's that's kind of where I was going. And yeah, so so feather feather at the moment is, you know, it it redlines at um, disk, you know, like disk throughput. So I think with with Parquet, um, because it's there's an explicit trade-off between I/O efficiency and CPU efficiency, like multi-threading and like pipelining. You know, deserial. Like, if you're reading multiple columns from a really big file or set of files, that's where like scheduling, you know, or like running, you know, eight using eight cores, using 24 cores. Like, it's explicitly because of the because um, in Parquet, like the amount of data that you're reading off disk is much smaller, but you have to you have to decode it, and so you can get a lot more throughput by um, by doing you know. So I think like single threaded, so like single threaded um, feather versus single threaded parquet, it's probably a coin toss. I mean, I'm interested to see what the numbers look like, but um, but like in multi-threaded, I think you'll be able to get a lot better throughput with uh, with parquet. What is the best practice you've seen in the tests you have done? About multi-threaded, single-threaded, and also buffering up data in. What does it start to fall over? <laughs> um, to be honest, I haven't been doing a lot of I've been doing a lot of multi-multi-threaded uh, programming lately, so I uh, I don't have I don't have too much advice. Please, absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, let's go ahead and thank Wes for an awesome talk. Thank you. The video for tonight's talk will be available in a couple of weeks on the Meetup website.